fielder. He's gone to the dog. Puppy paper. They almost look like a mutt, you know, compared to, you know, coon hounds that I was used to. And uh, I had a red bone that I was working. Um, and I had her with me one night and I went to the box to dump him out. And he was the kind of dog you weren't going to catch him unless he got treed. He'd be leaving your coat there the next morning. Um, anyway, I let him out and she went the other way. She just hopped out of the truck and was treed probably 60 yards away. And I just, like my jaw hit the ground. I just couldn't believe it was this easy. You know, I, if I ever ran a coon before it would take me 20 minutes to tree it, it seemed like, you know, and I was just, it didn't take me long to figure out that this is what I'm going to focus on. And I mean, she wasn't even finished at that point. And that, that was my introduction to the, to the Ladner dog. Okay, friends, we're talking with Andy White from Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Andy uh, begins our podcast here to kind of go talk about coon populations. So, you know, for this episode, you may want to put on some nice warm clothing, maybe a wool hunting coat if you're in the outdoors, uh, add a log to the fire, grab something warm uh, to drink, hot chocolate or, or a, a good strong cup of coffee, and we're going to coon hunt youper style here for the next few minutes. Andy, I apologize for this technical uh, situation that continues to plague us, but we're going to kind of go back over some of the things that you and I were already talking about uh, when I discovered that we weren't getting it uh, recorded the way that we should. Um, I will tell our listeners that I met Andy through Facebook Messenger when he wrote to say that he enjoyed the podcast, and of course I thanked him, and he told me about his dogs and uh, sent me a video, which I really enjoyed, and I want to talk to him about that as well. And he uh, kind of stroked my ego a little bit by asking about the cur dogs that are back in uh, my family history that my dad and his brother hunted in Tennessee when they were young. Andy, it's kind of like deja vu all over again here, but I want you to give our <laughs> listeners uh, a short bio about you, uh, about your family, about what you do for a living with with my, uh, my apologies, my friend. That's okay. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I live in the north. Uh, Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. I'm 36 years old. I've got two girls. Uh, Adeline is 12 years old um, and Harper is five. And my wife's name is Michelle. And I am a farrier, a horseshoer, and uh, I also farm full time. And that's pretty much my life. That sounds like a pretty full life for sure. Uh, do, do the, uh, does the wife tolerate and the kids enjoy the hunting activities? <laughs> yeah. My, uh, my oldest daughter, she really likes to, uh, to squirrel hunt. Um, she wishes I'd probably take her out. We haven't been out yet this year. Um, and, uh, my youngest, she actually likes the coon hunting pretty good. She's, uh, pretty wicked through the woods for a five-year-old. She can <laughs> get right under there and go. Well, you've told me in the past that she's kind of the one that's more adventurous of the two, right? Yeah, she's she's a wild card for sure. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, you told me an interesting story about when you were going to horseshoeing school down in Kentucky, and perhaps that was your introduction to tree dogs or coon dogs. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the, the first time I heard um, hounds, or tree dogs, I guess. Um, there was an old distillery um, behind the school. I went to school in Mount Eden, Kentucky, at the um, Kentucky Horseshoeing School, and it was like an old elementary school. And if you walked as the crow flies, it'd be northeast of the school down into a holler, and you go back up another little hill. There was an old wild turkey distillery, and us kids used to climb up there, and there was like barnwood beams that they would roll the the barrels on and we were up there hanging out one night and we heard this low you know 
sound. We were all were kind of scared. And um, pretty soon two boys came along with some lights and stuff. And they, uh, that was my introduction. And I found out after that they were coon hunting. And then I started to pay attention afterwards. And I noticed that that area is pretty rich uh, for coon hunting. A lot of it, a lot of it goes on there in Mount Eden. Well, Kentucky, of course, is kind of the fountain uh, of the hound hunting in this country. Uh, well, you know, pioneers that came over, the settlers all had dogs of one kind or another, but the famous fox hunting family, the Walkers and and also the Maupins and those uh, famous names in, in hound hunting history, you know, were fox hunters there in Kentucky. So, uh, that uh, that's long been a heritage in that state, and uh, it continues to be one of the the uh, leading states for coon hunting in the country. You know, you you mentioned that you thought that these do- what what kind of dogs were these guys hunting? I think now looking back at it, I, I believe they were the the Gaskins, and I'm not sure if I'm saying that right or not, but they were they looked like blue ticks, but they were. Uh, the ears were like as long as the real old school black and tans and just probably a hundred, a hundred plus pounds, I would say. Right. Well, these guys were pretty old school, I guess. About what year was that? Do you recall? It would have been probably Oh seven. I see. Okay. Well, um, uh, those guys, yeah, if they were hunting the gas guns, they were, I would say they were pleasure hunters. Those dogs were pretty uh, much, del- I'll get in trouble for saying this, but I believe the stereotypical Gascon is more of a, uh, 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 trailing hound, deliberate trailing hound, maybe more so than, uh, some of the blue ticks that we might see in the competition hunt. Although I'm sure some of those hunters would argue that they, you know, they do tree coons and they treat them off of bad tracks and also. Well, it's kind of interesting. Well, you really did uh, a 180 from uh, your first experience being with Gascon hounds and then moving to these uh, these Ladner Blackmouth Cur dogs. I want to talk to you about that, uh, those dogs, in greater detail as we go along here. Uh, after your introduction that you made there at the beginning of the podcast. But uh, what's it like to hunt tree game in the UP of Michigan? Uh, What methods do you use? How do you go about it? Uh, You know, um, tell us about the conditions a little bit. You know, just an overview on all that. Yeah, uh, when I'm hunting my dogs, um, I will either road them uh, or rig them. I typically will rig them uh, more than I rode. I'll road them for probably a mile or so just to let them go to the bathroom and get, you know, any energy out. And then they go up on the box. And, um, you know, if there's a small piece of woods or something, I'll walk it and uh, let them hunt. You know, they'll go 300 yards, come back to me. Um, but there's a few reasons why I do that. And uh, one reason is, is big chunks of woods. You know, we, we hunt some chunks of woods that there's thousands and excuse me thousands of acres of land and i really don't want my dog going too far to start a track so that's a lot of the reason why i rig them i can judge how hot the track is by how those dogs rig and if you hunt them long enough you can tell Um, so when i'm rigging i want a fairly hot track and the other reason is the wolves in our area i don't want my dog getting too far away from me um, I like them to get treed, and I like to get into that tree as quick as I can. I've, I've never had any encounters with wolves, but um, I don't want any either. So I've been doing it this way, and it's been working. And um, yeah, and uh, a lot of oaks up here. I try to hunt the oaks. Um, it's kind of a mix, mixed woods. Um, there's cedars, white pines, a lot of hills, a lot of swamps. Um, but I typically try to stick to the high ground when I'm coon hunting. I see, and you mentioned the wolf there, and uh, we, we've discussed this in the past about the wolves, and your idea maybe that these cur dogs um, 
by the nature, their nature, the way they hunt, uh, perhaps their voices and what uh, whatnot, make them a little less vulnerable to the wolf. Um, Want to explain that a little bit? Well, kind of my theory, but when the bear hunters are hunting those dogs, um, of course, it's also pupping season, you know, and, and training season around here. Those wolves are having their babies and they're a little more territorial. But the cur dogs that I have, if it's a normal track, they really don't say a whole lot when they start that track. It'll maybe be one bark or two. And um, it, it it makes for faster trees because if, if a hound is barking, the raccoon knows he's being chased immediately. Where these dogs, they, they can almost sneak up on them. So it causes for faster trees. And those hounds, they get in there and they start barking and they might, you know, work that track for however long and they're mousing the whole time. And that's just kind of ringing. It's like someone coming in and digging in your fridge, basically. And I think that that's a lot of the reason why they have more troubles than I do as far as with the wolf. But of course, I try to stay out of bad areas also. If I know that, you know, there's an area where there's a bad pack, you know, I, I try to stay out of it. But anymore, you, we really can't get away from, they're, they're pretty much everywhere up here now. Well, I think wolves have become the nemesis of the houndsmen all across the northern tier of our country. I don't think it's necessary. I think, uh, you know, the the uh, listing these as endangered species and so forth have, have certainly contributed to the problem. And I, I, I am encouraged as I see some states beginning to lessen uh, those re- uh, those restrictions on on uh, harvesting wolves and all. You talked about the dogs being a little tight mouth, maybe maybe not barking as much on track. Now, when I was a kid growing up in the mountains, we had people that would hunt us, what we called silent trailers, but they were trying to catch the raccoon that for e- either they wanted to catch it and eat it or they wanted to catch it and harvest its fur and the theory there in the mountains where we lived which were very rocky steep uh lots of den trees lots of hardwoods uh that the cur dog you know would would pretty much slip up on the coon and catch him away from his den or or the a rock cliff or whatever uh but Obviously, with fur prices the way they are now and so forth, and I'm I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that you don't eat raccoon, do you? No. Uh-uh. Yeah, it's it typically not something that most hunters enjoy, although some do. Well, so the fact that your dogs are a little tighter mouth, is, is it more just the nature of the breed than your desire? For them to be that way, or, or you know, what can what can you tell me about that? Well, this is how I look at it. If if you got a dog that's semi silent, completely silent, or tight mouthed at all, he better have some speed. That's, that does no good if you got a slow dog. So, you know, I I from my old dog, the thing that I wanted to breed into since I started breeding these dogs with a little bit harder tree dogs and I wanted faster dogs. So that's what I've been trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, it, it just kind of depends, you know, um, if the track is really, really, really hot, they'll, they'll mouse a little bit, maybe just to get that raccoon out of that area, you know, because they're smart. These dogs are hunting with their ears and their eyes and their nose. So they're pretty darn sharp <clears throat> and they'll sometimes bark a little bit get that animal to move out where they know they can get him to tree um and there's and there's other times where i'm in the corn that if i hunt the pair of them like my two older females they probably catch 80 percent of them so i typically if i'm in the corn i try not to hunt the pair together all that much anymore because they they will catch them on the ground one will push the track and the other one will sneak and he'll cut it off and that's why that's what they kind of call drift tracking in this breed they know which direction it's going, and the dog will actually leave the scent cone and make a loop around and kind of cut it off. 
and it causes for a lot of uh, a lot of animals caught on the ground, which is it's okay, it's whatever. But if you have a young dog, you know, and that's the first coon he sees, I've seen it also work against you because they sometimes have a harder time getting the dog to tree if they catch a few on the ground with some older dogs. Okay, so basically, uh, well, well, first of all, let, let's talk about the dogs you have now. Or, or maybe let's go back. What was, you know, where did you get your first uh, blackmouth cur dog? Um, tell me a little bit about that dog and then how you've progressed to the dogs you have now. Okay. Um, I had a, I had a Walker dog and he was, uh, he was an okay coon dog. Um, I thought back then, um, but looking at it today, he, he wasn't anything really special, but I was just starting out. So I, I had high expectations for him and I did catch a few coon with him and stuff, but he was a better, uh, he was a better coyote dog than he was a coon dog. And I had a good friend that did a lot of um, coyote hunting, and um, he had this little cur dog, and I had seen her at probably six months old, playing around squirrels in his yard and stuff. And I just kind of took a shine into her. I thought she, you know, she was kind of a house dog, a pet. And uh, so we swapped, and she was about a year old by the time we we swapped. And I think I gave him it was fifty or hundred bucks on the deal. And um, before I left, he says, you know, these are these are supposed to treat coon too, you know. And I said, oh, you know kind of funny because they don't even you know i i I didn't know anything and i figured a dog that's a coon dog's got to look like a coon dog and these things you know i just couldn't wrap it all all in one i guess is what i'm trying to say and and uh i had a a red bone that i was working at the time and um she was riding with me living in the house and stuff and i got to the location where i was going to hunt and I jumped out of the truck, left my driver's side door open, and she was riding shotgun. And I went to open the dog box to let the the red bone out, and she snuck over and got treed 50 yards away. And that was kind of, I never knew it could be so easy, and it didn't take me long to realize that that's what I wanted wanted to uh, to hunt. And she wasn't even, you know, completely finished at that point. She was just a young dog, and it was just, it was pretty impressive. Well, I made, that was my that was my first I dog. See, yeah. I see him. What was her name? That was Timber. Timber. Okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah. All right. Well, um, and then so from Timber, where'd we go? So from Timber, uh, I had her for <clears throat> I think we hunted her for probably I think she was seven, and uh, I ended up getting married. And when when I got married, we took our honeymoon to Tennessee, and I searched all over the place for a. Uh, for a male dog. Um, and I came across, um, this dog He was a year and a half old and his name was Cherk Hughes rock. Um, guy by the name of, uh, Marvin Howard owned him and, uh, brought him home and he was a really nice dog. Um, but the, this breed, um, by the time they're six months old, that's what you're going to have. So you need to expose those dogs to any type of, of style hunting that you can that any way that you want to hunt you have to show them that by about six months old and this dog was strictly a cut dog and like i say he was a year and a half old and i could not get him to road or to rig so i ended up selling him he was a good dog he would catch every coon in a piece of woods but you had to walk with him um so anyway i raised a couple litters off of him and i got a little more speed into my dog um and I kept the female out of that litter, and that's my crumbs dog. And then um, she was in the video that I showed you of the cornfield. Right. And I've got her sister. What's that? No, no, I said I'm just agreeing with you. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. And then I bred to a um, uh, dual uh, champion that Lloyd Frisbee owned, and he was an NKC and a different um, – I don't know the other organization, but he was a night champion, squirrel champion. And that dog's name was Bud. Um, and I got a litter out of uh, my old timber dog and Bud. And I kept a female out of that. And um, so that's the two older females that I've got now that are finished out pretty, pretty nice dog. Well, now there is a difference between the Ladner black mouth cur dog and just the black mouth cur dog is is there not yeah there yeah there's all kinds of different uh you know uh, families that they 
that they have came from. Um, yeah, and these are the Ladner um, black mouth curs, but there's two types of different registries, and actually I've got some in front of me right now, but some say yellow, and some just say, like I'm looking at this one right now, the female Ladner black mouth cur, and then I've got others that say yellow. And I don't quite, I'd be lying to you if I told you I understood how that works, but I'm going to try and sum it up the best I can that you cannot get a yellow dog from two yellow dogs. Some of these dogs are red, some are brindle, some are black, but they're typically the old foundation dogs that L.H. Ladner, that's the guy that first registered these dogs, and they were the first black mouth cur ever to be registered. He really promoted these yellow dogs, um, and that's what all of mine are, are the yellow dogs. I see. I see. Coloring, anyway. Yeah. But the two... Two I've got here, these two pups here, they're they're just uh Ladner. They don't say I'm looking at the papers right now. They don't say yellow on them. And those papers are with what which registry? Uh this is NKC. I see. National Kennel Club. All right. Well, um what other colors do they come besides yellow? Oh, just about any color you can think of. The most common is uh is the yellow. Um Bud, the dog that I bred to, he was like a two-tone color. He was red, and then he was like a like a milky. Um, I'm trying to think of that color, um, Buck's buttermilk. Scandal. Buttermilk, I would guess color. you'd say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And they call those dogs a ghost face when they're two-tone like that in the Land Ladner breed. And uh, this shiver female that I've got, she's two-tone like that. She's yellow on top, and then she's white underneath. And then, uh, crumbs. She's a what they call a, a golden eye. Her dad had these almost like wolf eyes, and uh, she's got she's got those eyes. And so there, yeah, there's a lot of different variations to them. And I see. Is there any preference with that now in my breed uh, that I've been, you know, associated with for many years? The plot dog. Uh, we wanted a dark eye, or a hazel color was okay. Uh, did not really prefer the yellow eyed dog. Uh, is there any stipulation in this? I know we don't need to drill down into every aspect of the breed standard, but I'm just trying to get familiar with these dogs a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, you know, I, I don't know as far as, as far as, uh, you know, wh- what I look for, I, I, I would like, um, a non golden eye versus a regular eye because it's hard to judge a dog. You walk up to a dog with golden eyes, you can't tell if he's cross or not. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense, mm-hmm. but they, they mm-hmm. just, they got a different look about them and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, what I look for is I look for a tight foot and a black mouth. That's really what I look for. And confirmation is the last thing I look for in these dogs. Okay. Now, when we say black mouth, we're typically talking about the flus around, around the, the gums and so forth. I mean, the, um, you know, the outline of the, of the mouth of the dog, are they actually black inside like a, uh, a, uh, chow or, or something like that? Well, I- yeah, actually how it started, it was just, you know, you, you want a dog, any dog, you, you typically want the roof of their mouth to be black. Mm-hmm. They bred that so much into these dogs that it came out onto the outside. Most of my dogs um, are just black under the chin. Like these two females that I've got here, their their mouth is black in the inside, their tongue is pink and stuff, but their uh, the bottom of their chin is black. But I've got a young female that we got from Mississippi earlier uh, this fall, and she's black up to her eyes. In the male, he's, he's pretty black on top too, but uh, it started it started in the mouth, and then it was just bred into them so much that it, that it came out. Well, what about to live with a black-mouth cur dog or, or a yellow black-mouth cur dog? Uh, what's their temperament like? Uh, their temperament is, uh, it, it's, it's great. Um, I mean, they're like having a lab in the house. Um, they're very protective of children. Um, if I had to get after one of my kids right now, I'd have to put crumbs in the bathroom probably because she'd have my butt. 
Um, <laughs> and I never broke it. I could break her of it, but I don't want to because I don't have to worry about weirdos. You know, if them kids mm-hmm. are outside playing or something and anybody weird comes up, I don't, don't really have to worry. Um, they're good in the house. As far as a farm dog, I don't think they're the best farm dog just because these dogs are looking for something to kill no matter right. what. If there's a mouse around, one time they caught a, a rat and the rat went up underneath my new truck and they pulled every uh, hose, vacuum hose out of that thing. And I mean, they got the rat, but they're just, they can be destructive when they're together. If you got just one out, they're not too bad, but like anything, you know, they're in competition when they're, when they're together. I got you. And I'm assuming, well, I know this because I've seen your videos. They're very athletic, aren't they? Yeah. 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 I look for, I want them built like how I'm doing this. You know, I've kind of, kind of doing my own thing and trying to perfect things as I go and, you know, making better dogs, not more kind of a thing. And I, I want a real deep, deep, uh, rib cage, like almost built like a cheetah. Um, and I don't want a big dog. I, I like these dogs, you know, at, at a maximum, these females at about 55 pounds. And the reason why is I just, they're, they're faster than anything on top of it anyway, but you start getting a bigger dog and I just find that they're, they're just not as fast, not as agile. Well, I'll agree with you there. And, um, uh, you know, I just did a podcast about, uh, the bear pin plots, which was my families uh my dad and i bred those dogs for a number of years and some of the things that we bred for were that medium-sized dog that athletic dog the dog that was had had a deep chest not a wide barrel chest um had you know um athletic ability and we could go on to a whole dissertation here on the anatomy of the dog you know but the dogs, you know, the motor is in those hind quarters. That's what drives the dog, you know, the engines there between that rib cage, and uh, you know, the front front end needs to be well sprung, and 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 so that they it can absorb, you know, the pounding that that the dog's going to take, and all those things. But I just noticed from the videos that you had that the your dogs are are very athletic. Uh, I noticed they're the one when you were on the uh, snow machine and the dog was running along uh, b- beside. And uh, I think you were in on a on a sled there, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah. you know that's an advantage that I have over any other coon hunter. Also, is you know I don't have to kennel these dogs. You know, they're in the house, they're outside, and, you know, they, they listen like a blue healer. If you handle these dogs, they'll listen just like a, you know, they're real sharp, just like any other house dog and stuff. But by the time it, it comes time to hunt, they're they're in shape. You know, you don't have those two weeks of conditioning those dogs to get them ready, you know, and that's that's another thing that I, I really enjoy about the breed. Yeah, they, they really are beautiful dogs. and. And this brings, I was thinking before we, uh, you know, started recording today, uh, of course, I'm 75 years old. Many of my friends have reached, you know, retirement age and and beyond comes much more quickly than anyone would ever imagine. But conversation always kind of floats around to, well, as we get older, you know, typically the hound hunter, the coon hunter, maybe he liked the hard hunting, wide ranging dog. You start to think, well, you know, maybe the cur dog's for me, uh, or maybe I should start squirrel hunting instead of coon hunting. Which I'll give him some advice there. Don't do that because you'll walk yourself to death behind a squirrel dog. I've judged, you know, when we started the squirrel hunts in PKC and I judged cast after cast and I've never gotten a workout like that really. But, uh, you know, the cur dog, uh, really the, the dogs that you have, um, are not really, you know, uh, hundred yard hunters. They go hunting pretty good, don't they? 
they'll get in there. Yep. They'll, uh, this, well, when I, when I bred to, um, Lloyd Frisbee's male, Lloyd is in, um, Vestaberg, Michigan, good friend of mine. He told me, he said that this male is going to put some range into them dogs. And I mean that she, she'll go, um, earlier this year, she was, uh, 998 yards and was treed. Um, and I had the whole family with me up on Mission Hill when I I lost uh, service on the Garmin at 998 yards, and she was treed for better than an hour and a half by the time I got to her. And um, she's just a little bit different, you know. She'll uh, if there's nothing in the area where most of these dogs that I've had, they'll come back, and you, and you just know, you know, you can tell by that that let's go to a different spot. She'll go to her own spot. And, um, if the other dogs out there with her, well, she's going to go too, and they'll, they'll get in there if you let them. But the nice thing is, is I, since I made the switch from hounds is I've never, ever had to leave one, no matter how far in, if my voice can't reach them, I can tone them and they're going to turn around and come back to me as quick as they went on the game. You know, they're just, they're super attentive and, and that's, it's peace of mind too. You know, typically I don't have to worry about losing a dog. Well, there again, people of my age uh, greatly appreciate a dog that handles. And uh, we've talked about it here on this podcast before. Uh, Now, you said that these dogs are pretty much, uh, are going to pretty much have developed their hunting style by the time they're six months old. Uh, How early do you start? with obedience training and so forth with these dogs right from day one um you know they as as soon as those puppies are whelped whatever i'm going to keep i'll i'll typically like these pups we just picked up we got those at eight weeks um they'll spend uh a night or two in in the house and then they go outside and i always separate them because you can't i don't care what breed of dog it is you can't teach two puppies at once but you start that, yeah, start the obedience rate, rate as a puppy. Cause like I said, past six months old, that's really what you're going to have as far as not so much obedience, but hunting styles. You, I mean, you've got to, you've got to get them in the woods before then. And typically these dogs are going to start, you know, running and treeing by four, four to six months. You know, you, you should see them running and treeing. Okay. Well now how do you typically start your, uh, black mouth cur dog on game i mean you what kind of regimen do you do you use with your pups well pretty simple um i'll just go to typically the hardwoods and i'll just start walking them dogs just letting them go and they'll uh most times they'll see a squirrel first or something like that you know and and that's how they start they just naturally you know this breed was kept so tight within this family and they and they kind of only let them go to uh, good people, people that were going to hunt them, that there's, you don't find a whole lot of junk in this breed. Uh, the call rate is next to none. I mean, if you give the dog the option and not really the option, but the uh, opportunity, I should say, he, he will hunt for you. You know, they just naturally pick it up. <clears throat> now, another friend of mine, Terry uh, Haken, She's in uh, Michigan too. Uh, she has a bird feeder outside, and she gets squirrels coming up, and they watch them right out the window, and then she lets them out, and they just kind of naturally do it. But once they're starting to hunt and they show interest, I might show them a coon um, only one time um, in a live trap, <clears throat> and then from there on, I might hunt them with the older dogs a little bit for the first year, um, and then then they just take off. You know, I've I've had really really good high success rates with the dogs that I've raised here and the dogs that I've sold. Um, they, they all seem to, they all seem to really work out. I'm pretty happy with them. Well, I can certainly see that. And, uh, for listeners that regularly listen to gone to the dogs recall, um, just this last week or so, uh, a couple weeks back, uh, in one of the white river recordings with, uh, my friends Nub and Moore and, and Randy Smith and uh, Morris Hardy, we talked about starting coonhound pups. And basically those guys uh, 
you know, that I named that, uh, titled that episode 300 years because the combined ages of the four of us was 297 <laughs> years. <laughs> That's pretty close to 300. But at any rate, they basically said the same thing. You know, they just like to take the pup to the woods. They might show a pup a coon, uh, might take a, a coon tail on a fishing rod and j- jiggle it in front of a, a small pup, uh, get them to bark a little bit or something like that. But do that, uh, you know, very, uh, very limited uh, is the word I'm uh, yeah people people really overdo that I think in my opinion you know I've seen yeah. a lot of good dogs that you know they just they they just keep going with uh, the drags and the cage coon and it seems like to me when these dogs you know it, it's just like you never forget the smell of grandpa when a little kid you, it, you have to impress and impress them dogs <laughs> and as soon as it's not fun anymore the game is over with. They're on, they want to find something else that's fun. So you have to keep them interested in it. And you just, you can overdo it. I think with any breed. Hey, you know what? Things come up in these conversations that are jewels. Now I I had never heard that expression. (laughs) Kids never forget the smell of grandpa. But when you say that, I immediately think of my grandpa on my mother's side. The first thing that I think of when I, um, uh, think of him was his mouthwash. Uh, he yeah. always smelled like Listerine, <laughs> and uh, you know, yeah, it, my I grandpa just... smelled like absorbing. <laughs> <laughs> I see he'd been working. He had that <laughs> on those sore muscles. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. That's a jewel right there. <clears throat> well, we've established then that these dogs take training pretty quick. They're obviously smart, um, that you need to kind of, uh, uh, start them off early so you can kind of imprint them, so to speak, uh, for the type of hunting and so forth that you want to do. Well, let's get into this discussion just a little bit about the differences and we'll use your, uh, experience, uh, and uh, I know it's not all in, com- uh, it's all not all conclusive, but uh, you have an English coon hound that you recently acquired, right? Yeah. Tell tell us a little bit mm-hmm. about him. Well, uh, he was a dog that he came across um, Facebook, <clears throat> and um, I know a little bit about English dogs um, because I'm the only person around here that has cur dogs so i've i've hunted with quite a few people with other hounds and stuff in the english breed there was three english dogs that i had hunted with and they were the closest to a cur as far as intelligence and how they hunted and i just i i really kind of like them and i never had the opportunity to own one but i i kind of followed the breed a little bit and uh this dog came up and a young man owned him and he was up in barriga so you think the coon population is bad where I'm at, go up there a little ways, and it's, it's as bad or worse than where I'm at. And this dog came from Virginia originally, <clears throat> and he went to, uh, from, from Virginia, he went to, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the place. Anyway, it's a, it's a guy that trains dogs in Flint, and he was really well started. I talked to the man and stuff on the dog and um very well on his way and then this young guy got him and almost you know it was almost like looking into a mirror when i talked to him is he he had the dog you know running off game a little bit he didn't know where to start he you know he wasn't a coon hunter so the dog was a little bit screwed up and uh so i brought him home and um got him going on the right path and i think he's i think he's gonna make it i think he's uh pretty nice to look he handles real well well what basic difference do you see in the way he hunts and the uh the black mouth cur dogs that you have intelligence was a big thing you know um them curs they don't forget they think about the past present and the future all in one setting um it, it takes it takes a good coon to outsmart them um once they get going and they're settled in you know um and uh you know, 
I wouldn't say his nose is much colder um, than than these guys. At least I haven't seen that yet out of them. Uh, typically, hounds do have a little bit more of a colder nose um, from what I've seen of them. Um, but uh, it, it's it's kind of hard to tell yet on the dog. Um, you know, he's he's just three year old and he hasn't had a lot of justice done to him in the last couple of years. Um, but uh, you know, he. He hunts with his nose, and them curs, like I said, are hunt with their ears, eyes, and their nose. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I like listening to him bark. I know that. That's one thing <laughs> I do miss about the the yeah, hounds. That's the for sure. the one thing. Well, you mentioned you know intelligence, and I think that I I had a a website that was called plotdogs uh, dot com. And uh, this was kind of back when the internet was really getting cranking and so forth. And I built a page actually with some help from a a, a real web designer, and uh, I had a message for him on there. And uh, and I ran a poll, and I listed ten different characteristics of a hound and asked the the viewers or the users you know, which to rank these, in other words, and invariably, and when you ask this question of hunters or hounds people, they'll say intelligence is the most important trait that you need in a dog. And I think that has many applications, you know, can the dog absorb the training, understand and absorb the training that you're giving the dog? Does the dog have the intelligence to figure out just because his nose is telling him there's a scent trail there to, can he figure out which way it's going um you know uh does he know where to go to look for his game uh you know does he know how to locate on scent or perhaps uh when to lay up you know and that he has to have the tool but he also has to have the smarts to to apply mm-hmm. those tools to getting the job done you know the old saying is we don't pay a mechanic a hundred dollars an hour for turning a screw we pay him for knowing how much to turn the screw you know and that yeah that's kind of a you know i think back to a dog that i had named bronco he was a plot dog i mentioned him in the uh, podcast uh, that's airing this week as we're talking uh, Bronco was an extremely smart dog. I could see it from a very young age. Now, I didn't go through a lot of obedience training with him, uh, certainly come and, and kennel and things like that, but I didn't try to make a house dog of him. But he was very, very smart when it came to applying his craft as a coon dog or a bear dog. And, you know, he could take that old bad track uh, in February, that it was two or three hours old, I would imagine, and trail it across the cutover cornfield for a, uh, a quarter mile and come up with a, with a coon on the outside. Or he could buzz around a cornfield in August and treat coons like squirrels that were feeding up in wild cherry trees. And, and when, you know, a track would enter, let's say, a, a cornfield, He'd figure out real quick, like your cur dogs, I believe, which way that track was going. And he didn't spend all Mm -hmm. his time trying to run track for track across that cornfield. He just headed out that way, you know, kind of quartering a little like like a bird dog kind of. And before you knew it, he would be treed on the other side, uh, you know. And I'm imagining this is what, these black mouth cur dogs are like to hunt. Did I do I uh, kind of hit the nail yeah. on the head or yeah. on my way out in left field? Yeah, you, you know you, you you're talking about you know a dog with a good nose. It's it's almost like what I said about you know a tight mouth dog is no good without any speed. A cold nosed dog is no good without the brain. You know, so I think right. that's something that people should. You know, you're talking about those cold nosed dogs. There's more than figuring out those tracks and just that nose to the ground you know they got to have the lights got to be on upstairs and and uh you know that's something like with these dogs that that i really i i think came a lot from the the squirrel dog you know 
because they have to timber stuff, you know, when those squirrels mm-hmm. start to jump and stuff. And they uh, they really use their head. You know, typically, I very seldom come to a tree that there ain't a coon in. You know, it might be a den or something like that. But if they get treed, they've, they've got it usually, you know. Um, and that's something where with the hounds, I, I did lack a little bit because you got to realize, too, where I'm at, you know, if they if they come across the coon track that's that's the coon they're running there's no going in and finding four or five other ones and blowing off that track and finding something warmer you know they they really got to stick to it but that also being said i've ran into some trouble when i went down state and did some uh, some meat hunts down there you know my dog would go in and then there'd be a couple other coon tracks and they're not used to that so getting a dog acclimated you know um to the area is big too but having the brains to be able to adjust is there's something to that too because some dogs just can't adjust to a new area right well that's for sure well let's just suppose for the purpose of supposition (laughs) that we're trying to convince someone to switch from the typical coon hound of today with the nice big melodious mouth that hard, loud ringing chop on the tree, that go yonder hunting style and all, uh, to switch over to a Ladner yellow black mouth cur, or, or uh, did I get all the words in there? Uh, you know, I mean, I know that we're not really trying to sell all the coon hunters out there on cur dogs. But what would be the, uh, you know, the high points of of your sales pitch to a guy that was considering buying a coonhound pup uh, or a, a black mouth cur pup? I would say, <clears throat> but for the guy that doesn't want to walk in nine hundred yards every time to the tree, because that hound, <clears throat> say you got a hound and you got one of my dogs. And they both rigged that same track. I have never had a hound beat one of these dogs to the tree. And it's just, it's because of how these dogs run track. And it's also because those hounds, when they hit the ground, they're opening, they're opening, they're opening before that track, you know, and and the raccoon automatically knows there's somebody chasing them because they're mouthing off. So it's quicker trees. It's in, you know, and you get those dogs that can really drift track. It's, even quicker, you know, um, and I've had a lot of people, I mean, get mad over it. You know, your dogs are so hot nose they can't even smell a track. You know, they're, they're treating so quick. Those tracks are so, you know, they're so hot. Well, we dump their dog on it and he'll take it across the country. It's just the fact of how they run the track. And, you know, once they run a few, it's just like a motherboard on a computer. They almost memorize how those, those coon move, you know, and they, they work really good mm-hmm. as a team and they're, it's just, it's, it's the brains, you know, I, I think more so than, than anything, the accuracy of them. If that kind of answers the question. Well, I think it does. And, you know, uh, we're seeing a trend, uh, well, and a discussion taking place within the coonhound community about babbling dogs and about strike points and whether or not we should even have strike points in a night hunt. Um, you know, it's, uh, the, the old question, how does a dog open three feet off the chain and then doesn't open his mouth again until he's, uh, three quarters to a mile in there and he's treed. That's something I never understood. <laughs> well, I, I think I, I do understand it, but what I don't understand is why other people don't understand it. <laughs> but <laughs> you know um and if we get to the point that we don't have strike points in night hunt wouldn't these little dogs just be ideal i mean man alive uh, if you go and i see that um you know ukc uh, all the registries are basically uh kind of getting a, uh, away from this thing that the dog got to be open on track. And um, so even though these dogs do open some on, uh, what, you know, what would you say the average black mouth cur dog opens 
percentage wise compared to let's just say a a medium coonhow, not one that's real mouthy or or not one that's tight tight mouth, but just the average uh, of your experience coonhow. Uh, how much do they open on track? Well, uh, technically speaking, most of the la- like my first dog Timber, she she was just about a hundred percent silent. You know, you hit the ground, she'd bark once, then she'd locate, then she'd tree. These dogs that I've got now, once I bred to rock, rock was pretty mouthy on track. And I started hunting shiver with my crumbs dog. So my dogs bark more on track than, than most of the Ladner dogs. I would say, uh, I would say about 30% Mm -hmm. as, as you know, um, but, uh, but it all depends, you know, if that track is super duper hot, like I said, they'll mouth off until they get it moved out of the way. Another thing they'll do is they'll bound just like a deer. You'll see them jumping because I run light collars on them and stuff. And I think what those dogs are doing is they're making noise. They're right on that coon. They're trying to get him to, to shoot up a tree, you know, that maybe he thinks something real big is chasing him. That's just my own theory on it, but they just, they just got a different style. But I, I would say, you know, probably 30%. I would say mm-hmm. these dogs mm-hmm. are, are barking, but, and like I say, I've, I've had other breeds of cur too. You know, I've, I've hunted the camera dogs and, um, I had, uh, mountain curs and stuff like that. I've, I've tried those two breeds and they just, um, uh, they're, they're not the same, you know, that I'm not saying that they don't have good dogs because I have a friend that does have a few really good mountain dogs, but they, they hunt differently than, than mine do. Well, how much, if any, is the problem of slick treeing with these dogs? It's really almost non-existent, and I hate to, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but, I mean, if you don't see a coon up there, you better start looking, because it's not very, you know, they might have a hole in the tree or something like that, but um, I, I would say 90%, you know, they're, there's if they're treeing, there's, there's a coon up that tree. But like I say, they've only got the one to run too. You know what I mean? That they better do a good job on it because a good <laughs> dog in this country, you know, I can average two, two to, you know, two to five a night. Every night I go out, I pretty much can get two, but I've had the nights where I'll get 11 or 13 too, you know, if they're really moving or something, but it's just it's big country and stuff, but they, mm-hmm. I don't want them to screw it up, you know, and, but no, they're, they're pretty darn accurate little dogs, I think. Well. You know, I've seen the situation in southern Michigan where dogs came, let's say, out of the mountainous areas of the southeast or wherever, and they'd come up there and they would have trouble settling on a tree because of the number, uh, uh, you know, the abundance of coon. You know, if they were if they were a dog that liked to check a tree out thoroughly before they treed, you know, make a big circle around or whatever, chances are they may find another track. And then they, you know, if they take that one, you know, it was, it was difficult for them to stay treed. Uh, I found, mm-hmm. you know, growing up in the mountains where coon were extremely scarce, I found that our dogs were a lot more accurate, you know, than, than, mm-hmm. uh, but, uh, that's a lot in the breeding too, because those same, that same bloodline of dogs, when I took it to Michigan, uh, you know, they didn't have any trouble treeing because they like, uh, you know, th- they wanted to get their teeth in the game. Now that brings up the the point about the uh, uh, the black mouth cur dogs as well. They are pretty gamey, aren't they? Very, yeah, very gamey, very gritty. Almost uh, this one female I've got, she's almost overly gritty. Um, uh, yeah, I mean that. And I'll tell you, with the breeding that I've got going right now, when these puppies start, they are about the trashiest thing you'll ever see. I mean, they will chase anything that runs away from them. Um, this last dog I had here, she chased uh, a mallard duck across the 80-acre <laughs> hayfield back and forth and back and forth. And I just let them do it, you know. Um, mm-hmm. you, you can break them off that stuff later, you know. Let them hunt. Yeah. Let them, yeah. you know, it's... Uh, but. Uh, what I wanted to say about this area too, uh, I've seen really good dogs. Just in mind, I had a good friend that he went to Indiana and he tried this, this powerhouse Walker dog. And I mean, she was a coon dog and he brought that dog up here 
and she trashed off for probably a good two weeks. And it's just, you know, you go from an area where the first track you come is a coon to an area where it takes four hours to find a coon track, you know, and, and that was an old dog, a good broke dog. And, um, it's just this, this area can really mess with the dog. And, um, she finally did settle in, but there is the dog. I've seen dogs come up from downstate that just cannot hunt this ground. They just, Mm. they, they can't adjust to it. You know, there's some dogs that can adjust good, you know, and there's just some that I've seen that just never really were very good up here. Well, I think that maybe has to do with heart and desire in a dog. Uh, whereas, you know, your dogs are used to hunting where game is more scarce. When I say game, I mean fur, fur bears, uh, coon primarily. And they're just determined that they're going to find a coon. Yeah. And they kind of just ignore all this other stuff where the, the dog that's used to the easy coons, we call them, you know, they hunt in these coon zoos <laughs> in the south. Uh, yeah, south, almost southern. lazy. Yeah, I see what yeah, you're saying. Uh-huh. So they get lazy yeah. about it, you know, and uh, mm-hmm. and I've I've seen that. I, another thing I wanted to talk about just a minute and, and back up to a rewind to the idea of, of hunting these dogs in competition. How do they get along with strange dogs when you hunt them? Say I bring this uh, jug-headed walker dog that I've got up there to go hunting with your dog. How are they going to react to that? Well, I will tell you this, that they've got a bad name. But it ain't the Ladner dogs that got a bad name. I have talked to quite a few people on social media and stuff, and they talk about these dogs being alligators, and I have not experienced that. You know, they, they'll they fight just like any other dog will. Um, but most of my dogs, um, just like I brought that new English dog home, and these are both pretty belly-up tree dogs. They got with that dog, <clears throat> and they gave him the tree. They just sat back, and they got away from it. One thing about this dogs is they don't like trouble. If you're going to reprimand them from something, they'll do anything to try and not get in trouble. And it don't take much. You know, you can just scold these dogs and that's good enough. You know, you don't want to hurt their feelings too much, but they, uh, it's, yeah, I mean, um, they're, they're pretty good about hunting with new dogs, but the one thing I've learned, like these two older dogs, now they're both laying on the couch behind me. Uh, you hunt them with dogs that are outside dogs and they can smell the difference. Just, you know, an outside dog has a stronger smell typically and they know and any dog that's kept in the house, at least with my dogs, they don't really like to hunt with those dogs that are kept outside. They will, but they'll keep their distance from them all the time. They, it's almost like they think they're better than those dogs because they're kept (laughs) outside. And I even see it with these younger cur dogs. Um, but as far as aggression, no, I, I, but I handle them so much, you know, I, I get right after them if they so much as growl at one another in the house or anything. And that's one of the perks of having them close. The more you can control, the better off you are, you know, you don't bark until I, you know, you're not allowed to bark in the house. You're controlling. It's just same as a horse, you know, the more you can control the better off you are and i I think that kind of transitions over into uh into hunting as well you know well i think you're exactly right and a lot of the behavioral problems that occur with dogs can can be dealt with at an early age you know dogs that want to puppies that want to fight over the food bowl you know or uh uh excessive barking and that's another thing about in the house when someone rings the doorbell or comes to the door do they do are they of the nature to bark uh or do they oh, uh, just yeah. Kind of, do they yeah mm-hmm. Yo, they, yeah they're a watchdog i mean a, a darn mouse could fart outside and they'd be barking i mean they're they're so attentive <laughs> to what's going on like you say they're they're bred for those ears too you know so any any strange vehicles uh you know, other than uh, a Dodge diesel, if a Dodge diesel goes by, they don't pay no mind to it because that's what I drive. I see. You know, so somebody could pull in with one of those and I'm, even though I'm sitting here, they, they won't bark at that, but, uh, <laughs> um, 
the, the other yeah. thing though i will say about this breed is the males you really got to handle them as puppies because i've sold dogs to people and i've made a new rule that nobody gets these dogs unless they're going to hunt them as hard as i do because it's people that really I probably shouldn't have sold them a dog to begin with because they were going to more so hunt every once in a while and they wanted it for a family dog. But these males, they, if you don't get after them when they're young, I, you, you will have a problem with them. They are overly gritty. Um, and like I tell people, you know, I had this one guy and really, he's got a really good uh, litter mate to my shiver dog and he was showing aggression towards other dogs and stuff. I says, you get, you get after him for that. Well, I don't want to take the hunt out of him. I says, you are not going to take the hunt out of that dog. No matter what you do, you, he's still going to hunt. You know, you. Anyway, like I said about the whole six month thing, if you don't correct that within the six months, you're going to have an alligator. And I've seen it a few times in this breed, but only with the male dogs. And the people that had them were people with dogs and not dog people. If that makes any sense. Well, it does for sure, and. Uh, back in yeah. the day at the registry, especially at UKC, when we had to deal uh, so much with trying to defeat, uh, uh, you know, breed-specific vicious dog legislation, you know, <clears throat> and and it really came down to uh, the, how the dog is handled from puppyhood forward, you know. And uh, most of dogs' problems are people-related problems, you know. And um, some dogs are just stronger dogs or more heavy-duty dogs. Um, You know, obviously, if you're an elderly person and you want a little pillow of a Maltese to lay on your bed, you're not going to get a black-mouth fur dog, or I wouldn't imagine you would. So, you know, and that's a lot of the decision, you know, you mentioned um, a blue healer at, in one of our conversations, you know, uh, my wife and I uh, tried one, but we simply don't have the environment here for the dog. You know, dog was brilliant. We love the dog. I mean, he was just an amazing dog, but he required much, much more time and effort than we were, I won't say than we were able to provide him, but more so than we wanted to provide him and have any quality of life for ourselves, you know, at our ages. Yeah. So I think that's what you got to think about. But, well, it's been a fascinating conversation, Andy. Uh, these, uh, my goal is to get up that way uh, sometime. Uh, it's such a beautiful part of the world. Um, I love to go to Mackinac City, uh, Mackinac Island. I love to go to the UP. Uh, there's a lot of trout streams up there that I haven't fished yet. And I sure hope that someday I'll get a chance to get up there and go hunting with you and your dogs. Uh, it just sounds like they're awesome, awesome dogs. And uh, Andy, this has been a great conversation that I've very much enjoyed today. And I think we've given our listeners a good overview of the type of dog that you hunt and uh, given them some information if perhaps they're considering a black mouth cur dog for their future. Do you think there's anything that we haven't covered today that we should have? No, I think we I think we about uh talked about everything that I that I can think of anyway on them. Well, it's certainly been a lot of fun. I apologize for the gravel voice, <laughs> but uh, I guess that kind of goes along with the territory as we get a little long yeah. in the tooth, as they say. But as I said earlier, I really would like to come up sometime and see your dogs go. And I want hope you'll keep sending me the videos because they're very, very much enjoyed. Uh, and I'll extend the invitation to you if your travels ever bring you down to the Southland, you're certainly welcome to come by and I'll show you uh, the opposite end of the spectrum uh, and the extreme South and just how lousy the coon hunting can be down here as well. (laughs) But uh, 
I want to, I hope that uh, the new year brings you everything that you uh, want it to be uh, for you and your family and, and your uh, horseshoeing and farming and your hunting with your dogs. Now, when will it start getting warm enough that you can get the dogs back out again? Well, I can squirrel hunt um, right now yet. You know, as long as it's uh, above 20 degrees, then squirrels will still be moving as long as we don't have a ton of snow. But uh, typically when it starts to warm up, it'll be about the second week of May. Well, I want to ask you real quickly here about um, now you squirrel hunt these dogs in the daytime. Uh, Yeah, a little bit. We primarily coon, but um, I've started now um, for the first year and a half, two years. I strictly uh, squirrel hunt them now, and then I transition them over to, to coon. I see. Now, do you have any issues with the dogs, tree, and squirrels at night? Uh, the one dog I do, um, but it's no big deal because they're flying squirrels. Oh, and I if see. it's a flying squirrel, she'll just go about, I mean, right off the road. You know, she won't rig them. It's only when we're roading. And she'll just kind of go up there and bark once and look at me, and you just ignore it and keep going. She'll I see. go back out in front of you. You know, but it can be discouraging if you don't know that that's what they're doing, you know, and it did take me a little while to figure it out, but, uh, that is one downside, but most, most of them won't really mess with them much, but she, she likes to squirrel hunt that one dog as much as she likes to coon hunt. So. Well, it's been uh, particularly uh, entertaining and enjoyable for me to visit with you about your cur dogs, because growing up, I heard many, many stories about my dad and his brother's escapades there in in middle tennessee with their cur dogs pat and mike they squirrel hunted in the daytime possum hunted at night and occasionally they get a bonus coon along the way there and uh just uh hearing about those dogs and hearing about the way your dogs hunt and their intelligence and and uh all has you know brought back a lot of fond memories for me Friend, I really appreciate your time today, and uh, we're going to cut this thing off. We've been at it over an hour now, uh, despite our problems at the start. And uh, I'll just end this podcast, as I always do, if I've got voice enough to do that, by saying if someone asks you where's Steve Fielder, you tell them he's gone to the dogs.